I'm Sue Borison from Your Teen Media, um, and I am so excited to be doing this again. It's been a crazy journey for all of us, and the one constant we have is someone like Tori who steps in and helps make, it, make us and make our parenting and make hopefully our stay-at-home lives a little more tolerable. So Tori, we're going to start with you if you could introduce yourself, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me back. This was such a fun thing to do last week. Um, so I'm Tori Cordiano. I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, I have a private practice in Beachwood, Ohio, which is just outside of Cleveland. I am also a consulting psychologist and the director of research um, for Laurel School and Laurel Center for Research on Girls. So in my private practice life, I see kids, young kids through young adults, I see a lot of teenagers in my practice and have made the switch over to temporary telehealth for now, and I'm connecting with people that way. Thanks. Okay, Jen, tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Jen Pro. I'm one of the editors at Your Teen Magazine. Um, I work on the print edition, but also on our most recent fabulous all digital edition, because that was the way to get information to our parents quicker <laughs> that they really wanted right now, which is how are we surviving in this crazy new, hopefully temporary reality. So. Um, one of my, one of the best best parts of this job, I always say, is that we get to interview great experts like Tori and get free advice and hopefully pass it on to our parents. So it's very rewarding, personally and professionally. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here. I've got two college age kiddos who are home from school, doing the online learning, which they hate. And um, we're all kind of trying to keep out of each other's way from killing each other. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, so and Jen, Jen did an unbelievable job on the digital version with Sharon Holbrook, who uh, might be on the call. Um, and in the chat, if I can remind people who've just gotten on to go into the chat and tell us where you're from um, and make sure to change the two, there's a carrot that goes down, change it to everyone so that we can um, all see your comments. Um, and someone, is saying that she can only see three people on the screen. Huh. Is that true for everybody? Um, you might be able to go to, to gallery oh, view. Yeah. Or from, um, from speaker view to gallery view in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you go to gallery view, then you get the Brady Bunch style. You get to see everybody. And we Hopefully can pin for you, but we won't. Um, okay, no. so jo Jody Podal. Oh. Tell us about uh, Hi, everyone. Um, I am a, let's see. I'm sitting at home right now where I've been for the better part of two years for a lot of different reasons, but um, I formally, uh, I'm a longtime teacher. I've got three kids, two college age who are at home and one adult who lives close enough by that it feels like he's home too. And um, yeah, I haven't cut my hair in a long time and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm working for, with your team doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff. and. Um, have really, it's been really helpful to hear what these experts have to say and uh, how we're gonna, you know, get to the other side of this, which we will. So we just don't know when. Yes. Okay. So I also I want to any course. Yeah. You haven't gotten a haircut, and my dog hadn't either. So last night we groomed her. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm not coming over for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would say if you saw my dog, you you would re know really strongly you shouldn't come over to our house. <laughs> um, so Tori, I want to start with a question um, about siblings because now, Great. for some of us, we've been confined for almost a month now, um, mm -hmm. and and the the excitement might have waned, um, and the the bickering and maybe even more than the bickering is is starting to get a lot of, like really irritating really difficult to tolerate um yeah. so if yeah. you can address that yeah so and I, I said the other my husband and i were talking the other day and our kids are younger but i said i fear that they've lost any sense of how to act around other children that aren't their siblings because you know there, there's a lot of rough housing there's a lot of bickering there's a lot of fighting there's a lot of all of those things that you would expect that happened like over a long weekend. And this is now stretching into a month or more for some people. And is, you know, as the title today says, no end in sight. So I think one of the things that's helpful is as we go through sort of each new week of this to add some structure to it and to sort of recalibrate of 
week one looks different than week three, looks different than week five, to sort of think together, and maybe it happens midweek, maybe it happens on a Sunday night or a Monday morning of, all right, here's where we are this week. What are some of the things that we need to shift to make week four work for us? And those are likely gonna be different than what week one looked like. For example, as you're getting into week four or week five, you may decide that you need to set some structure around who gets the good workspace at what time of day. And maybe that level of structure didn't feel necessary in the first couple of weeks of this, but as we're getting further into it, having some ways to respect other people's space that everyone is on the same page about. So if it's who gets what workspace, if it's who gets the good TV, if it's who is you know, doing the Zoom call at this time, and how to communicate with each other around, you know, it's, it's my turn for this, or I need a little bit of space, or something came up that I wasn't planning on, to have everyone on the same page, but to expect that the systems that were working at the beginning may need to be tweaked and re recalibrated as we get further into this. So can we take a second and ask people who have any sibling questions to put them in the chat? Um, and I guess if it's all bliss at your house, hats off to you. <laughs> uh, we'll go back to that and we'll move on to another question. Yeah. Ask your questions in the chat. So my siblings are my kids who are, are getting along well. They're united in their lethargy at the moment. Yeah. And I find myself as time goes on feeling this, you know, oh my gosh, you're wasting away here doing things that are really not that productive. And yes, they have online courses, but one who is a college senior has very little. And, but I'm finding it really hard to even, as much as I don't like what he's doing, I don't know what to suggest for him to do instead. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I feel so stuck the alternative. in that. Right. I, feel, I feel embarrassed that I, nag a little and get upset and at the same time i i feel like i wish i could come up with something that maybe mm -hmm. he could do that would be i don't want to use the word productive but just different than what he's been doing for yeah. these first Tori, before weeks. you get to that i just want to say that allison says that yeah. hers are also united in lethargy and that might be the, the big phrase of the moment because i love that united <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, it needs to be like a, a band name or something. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, so I, I was flipping through the um, pandemic digital issue and if you guys on the chat haven't checked that out, it's amazing what you guys have put together that resource for everybody. Um, and one of the things that I liked in there was the list of, I don't know how many activities, 80 some activities that teenagers can do during quarantine. And they were such great ideas and a lot of just really easy, low hanging fruit. Um, I loved the idea of maybe just printing that out and posting it somewhere. We know that teenagers are going to be less receptive to anything that sounds like nagging or a lecture or a why don't you do this. Um, so if it's just sort of posted somewhere where they can't ignore it, that might be a good option. The other thing I think can be helpful is just getting a change of scenery. So even if you're being unproductive, go be unproductive outside. Go be unproductive while sitting on the front. Because <laughs> <I love that. laughs> uh, productive might be too high a bar right now, at least for a, you know big big swaths of the day. So if there that are times be... where, they're, where they're productive or they're having to engage in new ways with the technology, it takes a lot out of them. I mean, I, I'm certainly feeling that as an adult. It's sort of akin to like the first week of school, that good advice to never make big plans for that, you know, that first weekend after the first week of school. And they're feeling that. They're feeling like this is the first week of school minus all the fun stuff, minus all the cut, like fun fill up your bucket stuff. So it's the first week of school of we're having to get used to a new style of teaching. We're having to get used to new technology. We're having to figure out how to submit our assignments, how to get the feedback, how to do all of those things. It's really draining. So there may not be a lot of room left over for productivity in other ways. And so you don't have to be productive, but maybe just get a change of scenery. Go be outside, get the fresh air. Even if you're just sitting there on your phone or just sitting there you know, doing something else outside, it's nice to just be out in the air. And it gives everybody a little bit of space too. Part of the, the challenge, you know, what you're saying about the nagging is when everybody's on top of each other all the time, even things that feel like they wouldn't be, um, they would be easy to dismiss in our normal lives, they feel much, there's a lot more friction from them now that we're all together 24 seven. Yeah, although that would require putting clothes on. So I'm going to have to work on that first. <laughs> and so. maybe that's what the productive is. You got dressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jen? Uh, um, so 
I had a really fun little chat earlier today with Sharon Hol Holbert where we were talking about some of these petty annoyances that are creeping into our lives. And she had a list, a whole list of them. But my favorite was that she said, um, like yesterday, her kids were bickering over a cat whisker that they found. <laughs> and like, I said, what was the argument about? She said, they both wanted it. Like it was some special treasure. I mean, I find that, that our kids are devolving into some really truly like a juvenile, younger than their years behavior, which I guess is gonna happen. But what is yeah. the parent role when you see this, your kids devolving into this mm -hmm. insanely stupid bickering over something you know they don't even care about? I mean, yeah. should we just walk away? Should we break it up? Should we, so anything I, you do feels like you're taking sides. Yeah. Even if you're telling them that they're both being dumb. Right, which is what you're thinking in your head, right? Exactly. Um, Sometimes out loud. I think if there's any way to inject a little bit of humor into it, to add a little bit of levity to the situation, and it might be as silly as like, all right, all right, here's the plan. You get the cat whisker from 1 to 1.30, you get the cat whisker from <laughs> 1 to 1 to 2, right? To kind of like say it out loud so that they can see the absurdity of the situation. And like, maybe actually they need the plan for the cat whisker. But like, you know, to, to kind of put words to like, this is so ridiculous, guys. And to actually be, you know, when you're, when you're doing, when you're adding that humor to it, to be in it, instead of like, instead of making fun of them, you're mm -hmm. all making fun of this situation. Like, guys, this is what's become of us. We're arguing about a cat whisker. Like um, to be like, we are in this together. We are all recognizing the absurdity of this. That's genius. I like it. <laughs> Um, so I'm, okay. I'm, you know, it's like the old version of, I'm not laughing at you, I'm laughing with you, yeah. but, but you yeah. have to really I, get for it to work. Yeah, I was the butt yeah. of that in my family this week, and in a way that was really <laughs> lovely and not at all mean, but I loaded up our, our Target drive-up order with a lot of, like, new games that we could all play together, and one of the games that I thought would be super fun was a real miss, and nobody liked it, and so the running joke in our house this week is, like, let's go play Happy Salmon, and I, I mean, it's, it's a really, it's actually a very fun game, but, like, it wasn't, it wasn't a hit over here for whatever reason. And so everybody kind of piled on about like, oh, let's play this worst game, right? So it became our sort of running joke that everyone could unite against like, against something fun that mom proposed that actually wasn't so fun after all. Such <laughs> happy salmon is actually good. <laughs> I think it's actually yeah. a really cute game. We didn't give it a fair shot. <laughs> okay, so Allison says she has a hard time keeping her sarcasm in check with her kids when they complain. I don't think any of us could relate to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so you know I think sometimes just if you're able to step away for a minute right and you can actually say that comment under your breath in a different room you can you know text your frustration to a friend you can give yourself some grace if you're not able to do that every time and it slips out because it will uh, this is you know we talk a lot with teenagers about the work of repair in the relationship when it doesn't go the way you want it to and one of the silver linings of this is we've got so many opportunities to practice that and really to put it to work. So let's accept that there are all going to be times for us when the sarcastic comment slips out, when we raise our voices, when we make mistakes. And that can be good practice for let's go back and, and do the work of repairing that relationship. So to go back and say, listen, I'm sorry, that was way sharper than I meant it to be. And that's about me. It's not about you. I'm feeling really exhausted today. And I, I wish it hadn't come out that way um, to to you know, to step away when you can, to give yourself grace when you can't, and then to do the work of repair. I love that. There's been a lot of repairing at my house. I just want to <laughs> confess, a lot of repairing. So, okay, so I saw, oh, go ahead. Well, um, Carrie says that having an only child has its own challenges. So there's a lot of sibling, sibling discussion going mm -hmm. on, but it's true, like one kid to focus on has yeah. its own set of issues. Any suggestions there? Yeah. I've actually been thinking about this a lot. We have good friends, a number of good friends who have only children and that that's a really, it's isolating and lonely in its own way right now. And for many reasons, I think for parents, there's a sense of, you know, oh, we're managing multiple children while we're trying to work. And there's a sense of like, well, my one child is, is hard to manage. And it, that's true. It's all hard. It's all hard because it's hard. It's not harder to have this than this. It's, it's just all hard. And then the other piece of it that you have to be in with your with your child, no matter her age, is that if she's the only child, she's isolated. She can't, you know, even if they're bickering, even if they're nagging, there's connection. There's actual, you know, true face-to-face -face connection with somebody else. And if you're an only child, you, you only are getting that with your parent or parents. So I think a lot of empathy right now for only children and parents of only children is really important because they have their own unique challenges in this. 
there, there may need to be more um, opportunities for them to connect remotely. There may be, need to be more breaks from work for let's go for a run together, let's go for a bike ride together, because they can't rely on siblings in the same way that um, multiple children can. I have a little suggestion for that, if it could be helpful, is that if there are cousins that are of a similar age, um, they might enjoy creating a group chat where they can get together and complain about their parents' behavior because I find that that's a very bonding experience for them. Like siblings have that built in. The parents automatically yeah. become the common enemy at times, you know, and that's a, a source of humor in jokes for them. But cousins yeah. um, can also provide that support in a way because they know each other's parents a little bit. They can kind of like dig at each other. I know our kids, for some reason, I somehow I discovered that they have this secret group chat where they do this with their cousins. I, I love it. I mean, I don't know what they're saying about us. I just like that they're connecting in that way. So yeah, maybe that's, that's great. another possible opportunity. It's a little bit different from a friend if there's a family relationship there. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Jody, I have you on mute because there's a lot of background noise coming from your end. So if you want to talk, unmute yourself. Um, okay, so one question is, I'm concerned my daughter might be getting depressed and she does in fact struggle with depression. Um, she's not getting on social media with her friends at all. Mm -hmm. Tough times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we, you know, we talked about this last week. So for people who have mental health issues, for people who are uh, predisposed to depression or anxiety, need to be careful about this um, isolating in, in, in really different ways. So you need to be sort of on the lookout for what, what those triggers are for you or for your children and to reach out to the resources that you would count on in daily life. So that maybe if your daughter is already connected with a therapist, connecting her, reconnecting her with her therapist, or if she hasn't been to her therapist in a while, now might be a good time to reconnect. Um, her family, you know, your family physician would be a good person, the guidance counselor at school. A lot of the signs of depression that we would look for in kids are, are they're still there, but there's a little bit skewed right now. So things like you're not as interested in participating in your activities. Well, the activities are gone, right? You're not as interested in what you used to be interested in. That may be true, and it may be because of depression. It also may be because there's just a certain exhaustion of like, how much do I want to be Zooming or FaceTiming or, you know, connecting remotely with people. From, for some teenagers, that's not a really comfortable way to connect. So them pulling back from it, it may be depression. It may also be just the medium with which they have to, to connect right now. I think it's also important to recognize that feeling anxious and, and feeling a dip in your mood around these are typical reactions to this sort of this set of circumstances. It's not, it's an, and it's an expected reaction to these set of circumstances. So that doesn't mean that we dismiss it. It doesn't mean that we don't support or, or help connect teenagers with the resources that they need. But we can also understand that these are really expected reactions to this situation. And that language, that empathy may be helpful for teenagers who are in that right now. Um, so this is, you know, slightly different because it's a boy, but it's a boy who's not on social media um, at all. And his mom is wondering, like, is that a place for him to feel more connected? Are boys connecting through social media or are there other vehicles that mostly boys are using? Yeah, you know, I think some of them are. I think for some boys, it's it's something they're less, not all boys, but for some boys, it's something they were less interested in before. So they're not more interested in it now. I've also heard some parents say that their, their teenagers are actually on their devices less because no one's doing anything. So there's nothing to sort of like, oh, look, this is what they're doing. Or this is what, you know, this group of people is doing. Some, it's a lot more because it's their only way to connect. Um, so I think if it's something that, if, if, he, if he's really feeling the lack of a connection, it's something that you can suggest. There may be other ways too. So some um, boys or girls will connect through like the multiplayer video games, that that may be a way that they connect if they don't use social media. And of course, we're always thinking about like, what's a healthy amount of time to be doing that. But right now we, we do want them to be able to connect. So if that's a safe and comfortable way for them to do it, that might be a good option. All right. And, and uh, one more thing I'll say about that. Oh, sorry, just one more quick thing I'll say about that. For some teenagers who aren't really into social media, they may still want to connect one on one. So to text, to FaceTime, to Zoom with one or two friends. Um, someone mentioned last week like a Netflix movie watch party, um, you know, to do uh, over Zoom, to do those sorts of things may be more comfortable for them than social media, but it still may offer the connection. And if they weren't used to using that before, a suggestion of it might be helpful. So the, this theme keeps coming up with people, which is this, this worry that we have that our, ki our kids are isolating themselves too much. 
Um, and how do we know whether that's what they need right now and it's a good isolation or whether it's should, we should be alarmed and pursuing? Because it's possible mm -hmm. worry is just ours, but how do we know? Yeah. I think a lot of it depends on what your kid looked like before. So if your teenager was someone who really valued a lot of solitude and a lot of quiet one-on-one -on -one or, you know, by, by herself or himself time, and it's hard to get that now with everybody home all the time, that may not be a big shift. It may just be what he is doing right now. And it wasn't all that different than before. If it seems like a marked change from what was happening before, if your kid was really social or did want to be around even the family or, or friends or things like that before and is much less interested in it now, then we would be more concerned. And when we think about being more concerned, we would start by you know, asking some questions about it to see is this a bigger issue around mood or is it just that you need some space? And then if it's a bigger issue around mood, you do those same things that we were talking about before. You reach out to get you know, help from the resources that would be helpful. And then also to think about if adding some structure of, all right, we get that people need space, we get that people need alone time, we're going to say that everyone's going to eat a meal together. You know, maybe it's lunch, maybe it's dinner, maybe it's whatever, but everyone's going to have, you know, a meal together at some point every couple of days, or everyone's going to do something outside together. You know, we're going to go for a walk around the block, or we're going to play catch in the yard, or something to add a little bit of, um, I don't want to say mandated, but a little bit of like highly suggested together time. Um, and, to, and to see if that might be a way that your teenager would get on board with a little less isolation and a little more connection. So, um, yeah, I just, um, we, oh, sorry. I was going to say that we, for our kids, we've asked them to make one phone call a day to somebody that, it, you know, related um, that they could just reach out to. And we've kind of pitched that as it's their way to not only have a connection, but to you know, be a connection for somebody else who may be more lonely. And they've been pretty good a, about it. So, yeah, um, I think there's another option to to help um, to help them feel a bit connected is I think our kids are missing the opportunity to do things for other people because there's so much of what they might have been doing through a lot of them did volunteer work at school or through their temple or church or wherever. And that, that's all suspended right now for the most part. But there are a few types of outreach things that they could possibly do that would be safe. And if, if there's something that you can do that helps them get outside of themselves, they, they tend to feel so much better. And in our case, we have, I have elderly parents who live in a retirement community so nobody can go in or out. And my parents aren't very comfortable using Instacart. So um, I've been ordering their groceries for them. And then I have one of my kids help me wipe down all the groceries when they come in. And the one, and if they're old enough to drive, which mine are, they can drive them to the place and drop them off. So there's something to do. It's a concrete thing. They can feel good about doing it. Um, I know there's some food drives and opportunities in our neighborhood that people are still collecting for. So if there's anything that's safe that you can have your kid do that gives them a, a purpose, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, we're all looking for some suggestions, I think, on that too. Yeah, that's great. And it checks a lot of boxes. You know, it adds some structure to teenagers day, that idea of like, okay, I, at least I know from 2.30 to 4.30, I'm going to be helping with the groceries and doing the drop off. Even having that little bit of structure means like I have to get up, I have to take a shower, I have to get dressed, I have to finish my work so I can do this. That little bit of structure goes a long way. And then we know from the research on purpose that having something like you said, Jen, outside of yourself gives a big boost to your mood, a big boost to your self-esteem, especially right now when kids are, you know, that it's harder to find those opportunities for connection and, and some of them have been taken away. That's a great way for them to connect and to feel good about themselves and how they're helping the community. Um, I, I keep muting Jody because her family in the background seem to decide to help her and, and unload the dishwasher right now, which she doesn't want to discourage. So, <laughs> never. You can't yeah. ever. It's their, it's their sense of purpose for the day. Don't take it away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, okay, this is such an interesting one because this is this is global, um, and it's national in the sense that uh, we all are hearing what's going on everywhere. But it's it's not. Schools aren't handling this the same way. States and cities aren't handling mm -hmm. this the same way. So. If your kids are in school and having a very serious academic day and their cousins, who they may be like Jen suggested or connecting with, haven't gotten to that point yet, it feels like someone's on vacation, endless vacation, and why do I have to keep working? So how do you get your kids on board? 
Yeah. Yeah. I think you just kind of call it what it is, right? Say like, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see how different schools and states and countries are handling this. Nobody's handling it exactly the same way. This is the hand that you've been dealt. There's parts of it that probably are more challenging for you. I bet there's parts that your cousins will hit in a couple of weeks that are going to, you know, that you'll have already hit or that might be easier for you. And then they're going through that. Um, but to just, you know, give a little bit of empathy for, yeah, it's hard when it's not all consistent. And then to also help, if it's possible to help teenagers understand why that is the case that, you know, I've heard this a few times and it's so true that we're kind of just building the plane as we're flying it here. Right. And that's true for every school. It's true for every work, you know, company that's transitioned to working at home. It's true for everyone that's now parenting their kids who are in the house 24 seven. So there's not one way to get this right. And every school is doing it the best way that they know how and to just kind of send, put that message out there for your kids. There's just because their cousins have a lighter workload or they have a heavier workload, their cousins aren't graded, they are, whatever it is, there's not one way to do this. And every school is sort of finding their own way through. And what if, yeah, I think um, part of that component too is like motivation. Like even regardless if you have the same or less work than anybody else, just how do we motivate kids who really thrived on the in-person part of school and then now that's gone and it's all online and they just don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, the motivation piece is, is huge. You know, they're, they're used to that feedback from teachers and there's so much feedback and differentiation that happens in a classroom. I think one thing that so many of us um, are realizing, and if you, if you didn't have any connection with a school, you may be realizing this for the first time, school is not one size fits all. And teachers are experts at doing lots of on the fly differentiation and feedback and knowing how to motivate this student versus this student. And so much of that is, is, is much harder to do remotely. They're still you know, doing it in, in many ways, but it's not immediate, it's not face to face. So we may have to look for other sources of motivation and we can continue to help kids tap into the internal parts of it of like, is it something you're interested in? Is it something that you feel good when you get done? Is it helping you in some way to meet a goal? But if it's not to have some sort of motivation that is maybe outside of themselves, which is like, all right, this is what you have to get done for today. Let's figure out how to break it up. What are the little rewards that are going to come as you get each part of this done? Can you go out and go for your run, but you, you, know, you finish your math first? Can you plan to FaceTime with a friend after you've written that essay to help them build some structure for you know, how to get through it if they're not feeling motivated? Okay, so um, this one, uh, I think what would be helpful for many of us who are dealing with this, this, this woman has a 16-year-old who goes to bed at 2 a.m. and would sleep away the whole next day. So what's the language for that conversation? I mean, it, it's hard to keep having that fight every day. So how oh, do we yeah. have that conversation? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think any way you can be collaborative in it of, you know, I, I see you sleeping till four or whatever it is. I, you know, and I am worried about whatever it is that you're worried about. I'm worried that you're, you're not getting enough, you know, time up and active. I'm worried that you're not actually going to be able to get your work done. I'm worried that you're, you're digging yourself into a hole that's going to be pretty hard to get out of. That last one's pretty tricky because I think there's a, a big sense in this. This is already true for some parts of the country and the world that they're not going back to school this year. So in theory, this is not something that they're going to have to deal with until probably next fall in terms of having to be up for school again at 6 a.m. So one way to sort of get teenagers on board with it may be to say, listen, when school was in session, you had to get up at six. That seems ridiculous right now. There's no reason why you need to get up at six, right? What time do you think makes the most sense for you? And sometimes just shifting it to like, how do you want to do this instead of, I think you should be getting up by 10. You know, they may land on like, I don't know, 11, and maybe that's fine if they can get there on their own. There's no reason why they can't shift this bedtime a little bit right now if that's what their body clock needs and desires. They're not going back to school next week. So they do have a little bit of leeway of, here's when I want to be up by, let's walk it back. Here's when I, around the time that I should be going to bed. And then to help think about what are the, th what are the reasons why we want to do that. We know that if you have more time to be up during the day, you can connect with people, you can get outside, you can get some exercise, you can get your work done. These are all the things that are going to help, help keep you feeling good. Um, one conversation to start to have with teenagers about this is this, is this is turning into a marathon, right? And when we think about marathon runners, they have to be really conscious of how they take care of their bodies and how they train for those long races. 
And what that looks like right now is setting habits that are going to keep your body healthy. We want to keep our immune systems up. We want to keep our mood up. We want to keep our routines in place. So they, that, that can be a way to get teenagers on board with something that feels a little bit more reasonable, even though it's not going to look like their typical school day, bedtime and wake time. Anyone else have anything to add? No, but I, I did see another question that went by that I wanted to make sure that we get before it comes out of my chat screen, which is a parent said, is it a good idea or a bad idea to share that, we're, that we are also stressed and uneasy? as parents. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think it's actually a really good idea in moderation. And you know, you, you, don't, you don't, your kid doesn't need to be your therapist. And there's lots of other good places you can go for that kind of support. But it can be really crazy making for kids if what they see from parents is a really sunny, positive, let's be optimistic, look at the bright side, silver lining, we're doing this together. Because the reality is that we are living in a pandemic. We are socially isolated. This is unprecedented. It's really, really hard. And it's hard because it's hard. It's not hard because anyone's doing anything wrong. And so teenagers need to know that it's not just hard for them, that their parents are struggling with it too. And when parents can communicate that authentically and in, in small doses, you don't wanna drown your kid in this. This is not a like, let's you know pile on kind of um, situation, but they need to know that this is hard for everybody, that it's not something that's wrong with them is why it's feeling hard. It's feeling hard because it's a really challenging situation. I think I sometimes struggle with, I, like, if they are in a down place about it, and I want to counterbalance that and say, I like to say things like, well, we're lucky that we are able to be at home together. We're, you know, we're not worried about food. We don't have food insecurity. We have shelter, those things. And yet, I know that that's not what they want to hear at that moment. They just want to hear, yeah, you're right. This is, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and that yeah. it's okay to feel bad about the things yeah. that suck, even if they, even if other people do have it worse, there's always going to be somebody who has it worse, but yeah. I struggle to sometimes just take that beat and say, yeah, you know what, this is really, this is lousy, I'm sorry, <laughs> we're yeah. all feeling that way. And I think many parents have that, and it's very well-intentioned, right, and, it, and we know that if we're able to look at the positives, we can, you know, feel better from that, but the teenagers know that. They know that in many ways they're lucky to have, you know, parents who are still able to work and they're healthy and they're home and, you know, all of those sorts of things. They know that. And you're right. What they need to hear in that moment is you're right. This is lousy. It really sucks. You know, whatever language is the language that you use in your house of you're not wrong. This is just, this is just really hard. Um, and then, you know, there's other opportunities to talk about, okay, what we're grateful for and, and how we can help. And those are really powerful. But in those down moments to let them be down and to just acknowledge that the feelings that they're having are legitimate. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, and then I'll just tell you, Tori, there's a lot of very flattering comments here that we'll share with oh. you. Afterwards. Um, how do I deal with my 17 year old son who's begging to see his girlfriend? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so hard. Yeah. Okay. So there's so many issues here, right? There's like teen romance, which is so intense and they're, and it's like this longing that they can't be together. And it's so unprecedented that they can't be with friends and be with peers and be with their boyfriend or girlfriend. There's also the hard part about this, that in, in some communities, not everyone is consistent with this, right? That they probably have friends who are still seeing, you know, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a friend. Um, and so I think this is a place where, you know, if it is what your family is following and they're following the recommendations of the government and the CDC of how to flatten the curve and stay healthy, that you say, you know, it's fine to be angry about this. This is where our family is right now. Our, our, this is the way we've decided to do this. Here are the reasons why. I'm happy to share them with you. We can talk about them, but this is not something that we're budging on. And I know it feels like a punishment it's not a punishment. It's a, the, the value that our family has adopted to keep ourselves healthy, to keep our community healthy, to keep your grandparents healthy, to keep your you know, younger sister who's immunocompromised healthy, whatever it is that you can kind of attach some personal meaning to it. But to again, acknowledge like it feels punitive, it's not. It's, it's where we are to keep ourselves safe. Yeah, there was an article, I don't know, a few weeks ago and I, um, that talked about you know, explaining to your kids that what they're doing is really heroic, you know, by, yeah. by making this, you know, just to kind of frame it that way instead of, yes, it sucks, but you're, what you're also doing is so, you know, brave and heroic. like, I, you know, I, yeah. it, it was just, it was just, it was, it was beautiful, but I mean, I think that idea, so. Um, yeah. yeah, and here's a place where some empathy can really go a long way. If you're able to put yourself back into what it was like to be 17, 
and the thought of like, okay, for a month or more, no, no social content, no person, like in-person contact with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your friends, you know, what that would have felt like. And to use that language with them of like, gosh, you know, if, if I put myself back in when I was 17, this would have been so, so hard. And I have so much respect for how you're handling this. And I so wish this wasn't the case for the spring of your senior year or junior year or whatever to really lead with a lot of empathy around this because you're you're having to give them a message that's really hard to take mm -hmm. okay i'm going to ask one last thing for everybody to go over to the chat and allison wrote this fabulous suggestion so it made me think that we could ask everybody to type in one thing that's working for them that they think other people would benefit from so everyone just start typing away <laughs> oh, I like that. And people aren't playing along. <laughs> I'm just jealous of those of you whose kids are old enough to make dinner. <laughs> Yeah, I should have put the age down. I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Baking, consistent chores, a structured schedule with flexibility, swapping puzzles. That's that is like that. the meals they will join us for. That's great. That is. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Uh, virtual charades with the families we care about. That's fun. Online school, daily outside oh. exercise, children learning to do their own laundry, cook and clean toilets. Oh awesome. my God, hats off to you. Wow. We are probably raising the most prepared next generation of college kids ever. I have to think that they're going to be such good cohabitators. Yep. Yeah, and they're probably not going to speak to their parents for about five years after this, just to like make up for all this together time we're having now. But. Uh, online as much as she wants. Um, planned ahead with another family and made the same meal for dinner. Oh, and that's really time. sweet. That's so oh, cute. I love it. Really sweet. Oh, sharing something they're grateful for every day. Yeah, mine roll their eyes when I say that. <laughs> uh, shopping together for our elderly neighbors. That's beautiful. That's great. That's Happy so good. We want to learn that doesn't have to do with school, cooking, sewing, building, etc. That's it. Oh, I, I love the asking them though, because we all have great ideas about what they should learn, but like maybe they're really interested in something that we would have never thought of. Right. Yeah, that's a good thought. Okay. Yeah. Great. Corey Cordiano, thank you so much again. This was Thanks for having me. Was just so helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tori. Thanks. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye.